Good afternoon, everyone, and it's a pleasure to be here. As uh, Jackie mentioned, my name is Chris Smith. I'm a regional lending manager with People Fund, which is a community development financial institution that's based right here in Austin and serves all of our great state of Texas. Uh, excited to be here with three uh, amazing panelists that I think for budding entrepreneurs and for entrepreneurs that are existing and looking to grow, expand, um, some very valuable resources and understanding how to access capital, what to look for, pitfalls, different varieties of things you can attack. And so hopefully um, some great questions can come out of this today and, and a lot of answers too. So let me start by introducing uh, our three panelists. Um, Rashida Alshams with Just. Rashida is obsessed with making sure that there is equity in all spaces when it comes to Black women. In 2018, she embarked upon her own entrepreneurial path and created Woke Yoga and Wellness. This is a yoga, meditation, and nutrition collective based around the vision of holistic living. Currently, she is the project manager for Black Women Entrepreneurs at Just, a nonprofit financial platform that invests in ambitious Texas women. Rashida continues to find new ways to bring balance to Black women in entrepreneurship. Welcome, Rashida. Thank you. I'm incredibly happy to be here. As well, we have with us today Raquel Valdez Sanchez with BCL of Texas. Uh, Raquel is a fifth generation Austinite and has 15 years of experience in the field of community and economic empowerment. Her passion is building strong communities by promoting balanced economic opportunities for homeowners, small business owners, and consumers. As the chief operating officer of BCL, Raquel has developed the organization's homeownership, community development, and entrepreneurship lines of business in both the Austin and the Dallas markets. In addition to managing daily operations, overseeing the budget, and advancing the mission-related impact of the organization, Raquel has worked one-on-one -on -one with hundreds of Austin residents to help them fulfill their dreams of owning their homes and their businesses. Welcome, Raquel. Thank you for having me here. And finally, Casey Ubias with the City of Austin Small Business Division. Casey recently joined the Small Business Division as the Family Business Loan Program Manager. He served as a Contract Compliance Specialist 3 with the EDD Finance Admin Division for the last seven years. Prior to joining EDD, Casey served as a Program Officer and Compliance Monitor for the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs and the Texas Workforce Commission for over 12 years. Welcome, Casey. Thank you, Chris. Glad to be here. Thanks. And what we'd like to start out and do is we've obviously got a, a variety of folks here that do uh, some different things. I'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, each of you and, and what you and your organization do uh, that, that these folks can learn a little more about. Rashida, maybe we can start with you. Sure, absolutely. So, um, again, my name is Rashida Alshams. I am... Uh, I've transitioned from being the project manager at Just to now I am the um, community partnerships and community growth manager at Just. And I started out as an entrepreneur with this organization or with this nonprofit organization. And um, currently I am leading our, um, our efforts in growing our Just community. We provide micro lending um, to uh, small business owners we specialize in assisting women, um, the Latina immigrant, as well as Black women, and um, really helping anyone in general who needs help, needs any guidance. As I said, we do, uh, we assist with micro loans and lending, but also more than that, we are really about community. So if entrepreneurs are looking for a space to um, find individuals who are similar to them, um, and they really just need someone to kind of um, talk to, bounce ideas off of, that's what Just is all about. And I am currently leading a, um, a program initiative we have there called the JETA program, um, stands for Just Entrepreneur Trust Agent. Our program is very unique because it's all about trust. We do not uh, rely on or look at credit. We don't um, value, evaluate any of that. Everything is completely trust-based. So I'm leading a, prog a program called the JETA program um, that kind of delves into that and really helps build leadership um, skills for women entrepreneurs. That's awesome. And thank you, Rashida. And I already came up with 10 questions myself. I know the audience is probably compiling. There's two. So there's lots I think we can get into and talk about there. Uh, Raquel, maybe we can jump in next and you can tell us a little bit more about yourself and BCL. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, it's where I've worked in this community economic development space before I even worked at BCL. It's where I grew up in this space of working in community economic development, watching um, other organizations and mentors and individuals. And it's where I learned about small business lending when I was still in high school. I was 
thinking about and learning about SBA and the lending programs and really always had a passion for community and economic development, just from the mentors, like I said, people I would be around. So working at BCL has been able to give me the activity and the opportunity to work in communities. Rashida said it best. It's about building trust in communities. And that's what we're able to do with small business lending, as well as the technical assistance, the small business coaching, and the access to capital opportunities and the resources that we do. Um, we're similar to People Fund. It's where we're a certified development co financial corporation that's statewide, um, but it's where we are very vested in the communities we serve and the places where our staff um, live, work, and play. And so at BCL, it's where I'm excited to be able to talk a little bit more about funding and finance and talk about all the different pieces, because I think it goes back to, we're trying to bridge, bridge gaps, but we're also trying to be able to make it easy, make it understandable, make it not always be so technical from a banking standpoint, because we work in this different non-traditional space. And that's the best, coolest part about it, is we're able to create products based off of gaps of what we see in our community. And Raquel, you couldn't have said any better. I know it's once you get into this space and get to help people, there's nothing like it and there's no turning back and wanting to do anything else with yourself as a career. And I can speak to what a quality organization BCL is and we're not competitors. We're all in this together and we're colleagues and helping to grow the small business communities that we serve. So thank you for being here. Um, Casey, uh, let's, let's hear a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Chris. Um, like you said in my bio, uh, with my combined city and state time, I probably have a little over 22 years um, from the administrative and compliance side of funding, where a lot of this money comes from um, at the federal level, um, from HHS to HUD to uh, Department of Energy funds that funnel through cities or states and eventually end up in organizations like City of Austin's uh, Community Services, Economic Development, places like that where it can actually reach the people. Um, so in the 20 years I've been doing it from the back office side, supporting even this program for the last eight years, um, helping write their contracts, helping them report the numbers of the people that they help, helping uh, manage on the finance side. Um, I've, I've worked under finance admin, helping them uh, move the money from HUD to getting the loans through the city council and such. So I've worked on it from the support side of it. So in the last year, I was able to cross over when the opportunity came up to actually come out and I can actually start meeting the people. Um, I'm able to uh, go out and see these entrepreneurs firsthand, um, take their inquiries and see what it is they're looking for. And uh, so it's very different, um, different side of it, but it's what I've always wished I could do a little more of besides just making sure the money is reported and spent correctly. I'd like to be out there helping meet these entrepreneurs that are trying to expand or start something. And, uh, and maybe years from now, you know, see some of those results. So it's been exciting for me. It's a lot to learn, um, but it's uh, it's definitely, um, what do you call it? It's an exciting uh, transition for me. So ultimately the Family Business Loan Program does a lot of what um, my panelists said also. They do a lot of bridge financing. Um, they're able to connect and uh, leverage money for a lot of these entrepreneurs that are starting out. And uh, so currently I'm running or working with the Family Business Loan, um, which is uh, up to a million dollar uh, loans. And then uh, we have a micro loan program also, and we have a, a veteran micro loan program. So those are the programs that I'm working directly with. Excellent. And thank you for that. And, and I think that's what's interesting about that is it, it you said it brings in a whole different aspect of this. A lot of people aren't familiar with with what a lot of us do and then the connectivity with how the funds come and where do they come from and and how do I educate myself on on where do I go to find these things? And so. I think bringing the three of you guys here together today is, is hugely valuable for some of our, our participants here. I think what I'd like to, I, we touched on what we each do, but I think maybe a little more detail, if you can give someone that's sitting here, someone may need a $375,000 loan for leasehold improvements and they may need heavy machinery, but then somebody else may need 45,000 and it may look more like working capital and it may not be uh, something as tangible there. It, or maybe they're curious about uh, some grant opportunities that might be out there. So maybe if we could start um, with Rashida and talk a little bit more specifically about what a client experience might look like with you and what your loan process and, and, and your product may look like. Sure. Um, so wonderful question. So um, I just the, the great thing is that we are a micro lender. So um, we don't offer 
well, we go up to $10,000. Let's, let's start there, but we start very small. Um, and as a small uh, business owner myself, I know that that's, that's very big. Um, that's actually not something that's small. Sometimes you need help just getting flyers posted. You may need a little bit of money to kind of get your, your name out. You might need to, um, get some social media posts going and you might need a loan of $500 or $750. And that's exactly what just starts you at. We start you at very small amounts, um, all based upon trust so that you do have access to the things that you need to in order to grow your business. Um, and as I said, we are all about community. So along the ride of just, we give you a certain amount of time to pay the loan back, but you become um, enveloped in the, in the just community and you get to learn about other, we get to learn from and about other entrepreneurs within the community. Um, understanding um, from them and what their what resources they have, all of us share together. And um, as you continue with each loan amount, you you kind of grow along the process. So you can start at seven fifty, or excuse me, start at five hundred up to ten thousand um, dollars along along the, the way. So just has a variety of options that can help um, the different tiered entrepreneurs. It's awesome. And that's fabulous to me. I've read several books that talk about microfinance. And when you hear stories about someone that borrowed $3,000 and is now a multimillionaire, it's like, it's, it's not about the amount. It's about the vision. It's about what you do with it. And, and someone, I find it fascinating what you mentioned about trust. Can you maybe extrapolate a little more on what that looks like? Because everybody's expecting to come in, fill out an application, give their social and have a credit report run. It doesn't sound like maybe you guys function in that, in that sort of way. Yeah. Thank you for asking about that. Absolutely. So I just, we realized that money matters, but it's really not enough. Um, sometimes in our financial system, it's not designed to, to trust people. Um, we assess it or it assesses just how people, um, like what you can pay back. And it's not about that. I'll, I'll tell a little bit about my personal story. So I started um, in 2018. I worked at a bank in Washington, DC. I'm originally from Austin, but I moved there. Came back to Austin, had this wonderful idea of starting a, a yoga company. Um, quit my job, as I said, so I only was living off of savings. Um, and at the time, I just needed some money to literally post, post flyers and buy some yoga mats and maybe some cleaning supplies for it. Um, someone told me about a few things, a few places um, that I could go and get access to money. But of course, like I said, I didn't have the money to, I didn't have anything coming in. So I didn't want to take out a loan um, that I couldn't necessarily pay back. I was like, that's bad for business from the beginning. Um, especially working at a bank, I know I knew how that worked, so I didn't want to do that. So someone told me about Just. Um, actually, I found out from Just from People Fund, believe it or not. But I found out about Just, and um, I went over. They explained to me that it's completely about trust because People Fund trusted me to refer me to Just. Then that meant that Just trusted me. They wanted to know about who I was, what my dream was. Um, one of the cool things, they actually had me draw my dream when I first started so I could actually see it on paper. Um, it was based upon uh, just something I had never experienced, someone who was willing to give me money because they said that they wanted to trust me. And with that, that was all I really needed to make me feel like I have this responsibility now. I have something that I have to do because there's this, other organi there's this organization that's willing to, to believe that I can actually do it. Um, it, it just lent me a little bit of space and that's what I needed at the time. And the way that we build upon that is we ask that you um, build your community as Just tries to do. So you bring in other entrepreneurs with you and they become your support group. So when I started, it was a team of uh, me and two other entrepreneurs who are uh, I still talk to um, multiple times a week. Um, and we form the support group. We meet for one hour a week. We talk about our businesses um, and kind of really help each other grow. And every week we pay back the loan. We make sure that the other um, or we made sure that the other entrepreneurs in our group were if they needed anything, if they needed help. Um, with paying their loan back if they just wanted to talk about it they needed to brainstorm ideas or workshop ideas on their businesses we were there to support them to get to the next level because that's also we learned about a part about trust you have to be there to put in the time with the other people who you're around um, and in turn it all goes back into the system there at just so um Community is really what I say that just is about more than loan. You start out with that loan that seems to be very small, but it's really larger than that. Just doesn't ask you for any collateral. Um, we don't ask you for, we don't, 
We can ask you for your credit score. Nothing. It's it's strictly for, um, it's strictly for, just. It's strictly about trust um, and how how well we can we can develop that just from like knowing each other. That answers the question in a long way. It does, and it's a quality answer. And I think at the end of the day, you know, funds lending is how we get the dream and get to that end. But it really is just a means to an end. It's not about the money. It's about the things you talked about, the quality of the approach. And that's why I sit in the chair I sit in is because you can get invested in somebody and you can show them some trust and some faith and, and you can give them some of your energy and, and the results are amazing. Um, and now I want to talk a little bit about when someone comes and what if they, they may need more than 10,000. So I, I want to get into that, but I noticed really quickly, we do have a question that I think we can probably touch on really quickly, Rashida. Uh, the Just website states that you need an invitation. How is a new business owner like myself expected to be invited? Yeah, that is a wonderful question. So initially, that is the way that has to be. As I said, I was invited um, by someone at People Fund. So just works in a couple of ways. We work through our partners. And because our partners trust you, then we trust you. Um, or if there's someone who's already involved in just um, our JETAs are essentially the leaders of our programs. They're the only ones who actually can extend an invite to anyone else who um, they feel should be a part of it. Um, however, we do have a very unique um, situation where, like you said, you're someone who just Googled it. Maybe you're looking for things and you come across just. We have what are called our empowerment sessions. And that's essentially a session that you would be, that you would come to. Um, you obviously express interest to just um, and let us know that you're interested in finding out more. We would invite you to one of these empowerment sessions. We tell you all about just what it is that we do, how we can help you as an entrepreneur. And then you essentially, um, we find out what, what would suit you, what product we offer would be your will be your on your path and then you are essentially a part of the community um it's something new that we are um adding to our community these sessions but we we've, we've heard our uh, community loud and clear <laughs> and understand that it it makes sense to have another avenue for people to be able to access it who are learning more about about just okay good deal i'm, I'm glad we got that question answered and uh, uh but I, I did want to talk a little bit about obviously you know there are some requests for lending that are going to be higher than, than 10,000 and maybe what you all might handle, but maybe Raquel, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what BCL might be able to jump in and do for, for a small business owner or someone who wants to become one. Yeah, definitely. So with BCL, we have a number of programs related to small business. Um, we really start people off on getting to know just a little bit more about the organization and kind of helping guide them through what they're looking to do through our entrepreneurship program. What we do is provide coaching and education, and we then give them details about our small business lending. We also give them referrals and resources to organizations like Just People Fund, um, another organization that's a community development financial institution, Lift Fund that does small loans. And it's like Chris mentioned, we're collaborative together because what we wanna do is be able to try to provide access to capital. And so when our small business co customers are going through the concept of coaching and trying to figure out exactly how to structure their project, how to structure their financing, being able to structure that financing is important. Understanding what their full project will look like is really important. It's where we start to ask about personal financial. How are they performing with their personal credit? And when we find out that there might be an issue, what we do is we actually refer them to our small business financial coaching team. Specifically, those team members work to review credit and they look to look at issues that might be related to collections, medical, um, history, just you know, prior you know, behaviors that were done and how we can be able to then help you increase that score. A lot of traditional banks and credit unions are gonna be looking at score as a qualification factor. And at BCL, we don't use credit score. It's not something that we review, but it is something that we review in terms of making sure that your money behaviors and changes as you're running your business and operating. We want to be able to see you have good structure that you can become bankable and go to a bank when you're looking to do a $350,000 project. And so when it comes to our actual small business loan programs, it's where we have a number of funding sources where we're able to then structure programs specific to business needs. It's right now we have a small business loan program where we're able to provide up to $10,000 up to $50,000 for our new businesses. Our businesses are in that startup phase that are looking to expand and grow that are in businesses where they need that access to capital for working capital for equipment um, to be able to use for accounts receivables that they're waiting on contract revenue to come in. And that's where we're here to help. It's where we also then have our growth fund, which is specific for larger loan amounts, 50,000 up to 200,000. 
And those are where we're working with businesses that are actually in business for more than two years and they're growing and scaling. And when I talk about growth, that growth is relative to that business. It could be where they're growing to open up another location, they're buying new equipment that is going to be a major change in the way that they produce or they provide services. It's where we're giving them dollars to be able to help with marketing and outreach so they can be able to change the clients that they're working with or expand and have a bigger breadth of where they're serving. And ultimately what we're doing is we're still connecting our small business coaches while we're going through the lending and underwriting process. So they're working on strategies behind how to deploy that funds responsibly as well as how they're gonna be able to be successful with the metrics of growing and expanding based off their needs. And so it's where we're not requiring them to put together a business plan, which if they do have a business plan, we love it. But what we're doing is we're working hand in glove of being able to make sure that they can go through the process. And we're providing them with the technical assistance and the education so that when they're working on something like a personal financial statement, and if they've never done that before, we're helping them understand what are assets personally, as well as for the business. What are the liabilities that they hold personally? And what are the business liabilities? What is their net worth now? And what will their personal net worth be? And what we talk about is we talk about really helping them generate their own personal net worth as well as in the business net worth to be able to grow. And understanding how the two align as a small business owner, and they're not necessarily always separate, because it's where we want to be able to see small business owners as owners succeed and be able to be able to pay themselves, be able to create jobs, be able to have true economic value back in the community with their business and what they do. It's where I noticed somebody bring up um, regards to programs. And it's where one of the things that CDFIs get to do is we get to also operate and help organizations like the SBA, the Small Business Administration, administer their funds. It's where over the years since COVID started, there's been a number of economic recovery programs that SBA's launched. It's where the, one of them was the Paycheck Protection Program, which organizations like People Fund and BCL we're able to help individuals apply for that program and have access to that. It's where there's also been the restaurant revitalization program, the economic injury loan program. Those are both programs that go directly through SBA, but we're organizations that provide direct technical assistance to work through that application process so that if you are able to have any issues or any questions, you have a resource provider back locally that you can connect with. It's where that's one of the things that I love about the work we do is that we are able to bridge that gap between government and nonprofit and for profit with lenders and community lend, um, credit unions. It's where we work with banks, especially when they're like, we have this customer, they have a depository relationship with us, but we have guidelines that are just too hard. What can y'all do? And that's where we're able to observe those projects and take a look and say, because we don't have the same kind of underwriting guidelines around credit or the same guidelines around collateral requirements where we can do things like what Rashida is doing is using social collateral, having the relationships be able to back up and support that borrower. We're doing a lot of that too. And we still kind of look and feel a little bit more like a bank, but we're not. It's where we have that flexibility. I can give you an example of a program that I did and one of them, and I'll, and I'll wrap up so I can give Casey time, but it's where we did a program and it is closed now, but it's where we had a lot of borrowers who were able to go through the Paycheck Protection Program which was money that was forgiven if they used it for um, eligible uses. And then it's where they were able to apply for local grants that were funded under the CARES Act. And so getting them back into still needing access to capital, we designed a product where we had a 0% interest for the first year, 2% for the second year, and 3% for the third year. And it was where we were easing them back into lending and understanding what that looks like and feels like. We had a zero requirement for collateral as well as a zero credit score that we did a review because we knew that at the end of the day, we needed to provide economic recovery. And that program was specifically for businesses that had been in existence. So it was for businesses that had been a track record of five years or more, but it goes back to they still were hit. We had new businesses hit as, long, as well as old businesses that had been around for a long time hit. And at the end, we wanted to be able to create something which we had the flexibility as an organization to do and help those businesses be successful. Thank you. I think that's that you covered a lot of ground there and you brought up some things I'd like to go into with some other questions about preparedness for for approaching someone like a CDFI or a lender. But but I think to speak to what you mentioned, I know with CDFIs, we're the same. You know, we uh, the RRP program, for instance, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, CDFIs like us that that never relented in helping certain industries, no matter how tough times were. We found a way and, and it's not always doesn't always look clear cut, but it's a lot of shades of gray because we're trying to bend in underwriting. We're trying to understand your story. And we really want to dive in because we're like, come heck or high water. We want to help you make this work. 
Um, and if it's not a right now, it's a how can we hold your hand and get you there? Um, and that's what CDFIs are all about, relationships with investors, relationships with banks. We do a program called our BIPOC Accelerator that, that puts grant money and loans. I'm sorry, I'm muted. Uh, grants, loans, and education all into folks' hands. Um, and it's an ongoing effort. And these kind of things are things that CDFIs nationwide are doing on a lot of levels. And so it's not just one particular thing in one particular program, but it's just a huge effort across the board to, to try to help and reach as many folks as possible. Um, I want uh, to transition back over. Casey, I want to talk a little bit more about when, when someone that's either looking to start a business or is looking to grow their business comes to your doorstep. Tell me about how that conversation looks and, 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 and how you guide them and, and what happens from there. Sure. Um, first of all, let me compliment Raquel. I loved a lot of what she had to say. That was uh, that covered a lot of ground as far as um, what, like Chris said, what clients can expect to see and hopefully not be scared that everything is just about a, a credit application. Um, so to answer your question, Chris, it's very similar. Um, we like, we will, if someone reaches out to us through our austintexas.gov and from that website, they can research the uh, family business loan program veteran program, whatever micro loan program, whatever they're interested in, if they just start at austintexas.gov, um, they can search um, and it'll connect them with the program that, uh, you know, that they're interested in. So when we do get a, an inquiry from someone from the community, it starts with a, a couple of phone calls, just kind of talking about, tell me about your business, tell me where you are, um, just identifying where they are in the entire process. They've been in operation for three years, they just started, they have one year under their belt, um, they come from all of, all different backgrounds as far as that goes. So once we kind of have something there, um, we will next, we, after a conversation, well, getting some basic information, I'll have them gather some uh, deeper information and we will meet with our consultant in a larger interview and, uh, and get a few more details, um, a little bit of background, tax information. Um, and it's all just for the sake of identifying what kind of help they need and where we think they can receive that help. That can result in moving them into a straight out application through the family business loan program. With, uh, it can result if we feel that they have a strong enough background to go ahead and go through that, which is a little more traditional underwriting type of application, or it could result in some coaching referrals, um, uh, you know, as far as things that we think that they would like or could use, uh, business plan writing, um, a little bit of other types of planning, coaching. We have great, great partners like BCL, and people fund obviously EVBI places like that that help with these uh, referrals. And we just kind of get them to a point where we can get them that, um, connect them with the type of assistance that we've identified that they need. Um, that can be even with our own micro loan programs, which my consultant likes to refer to. I wanna reemphasize that, uh, what Raquel said about it, not just being a credit score, but my uh, consultant likes to refer to those as character loans. They are an evaluation of the individual, their business, and how we feel, you know, that they are uh, progressing. If we feel, oh, you're at a place where, you know, a uh, $30,000 loan or $25,000 loan could really move you along into that next step. Um, all the way through uh, working with veterans that um, come for the same thing. Uh, the veteran programs are not that different. It's just money uh, that we set aside specifically for veterans in the same entrepreneurial uh, type situation that want to expand or uh, move, um, move into another field or anything along those lines. But it starts, like you said, you know, it'll start with um, a, a conversation. Let's see where your business is. Let's see where you want it to go. And let's get a feel for your background. And then those will kind of lead us in a path where you can either end up in a traditional application and we'll start that process. Or maybe there's a few steps we want to do along the way to get there. But ultimately, I've always been told since I came into this program, we are a holistic, uh, we do uh, view this as a holistic approach. There's a lot more than just your credit score and how much money you're making. We do want to look at your, evaluate uh, a lot more about the individual because we do have the opportunity through some of our micro loans to practically use them as my consultant likes to, I love that he calls it that, but our character loans, you know, kind of in people we believe in kind of situation. So there's a lot of opportunity out there different types of assistance. Sometimes it's money, sometimes it's referrals, sometimes it's classes. Um, but we definitely want to uh, I try to identify some of the needs for any person who comes to our program, you know, inquiring about um, growing a business or starting a business. And thank you, Casey. And I think what's neat here is you're seeing across the board that 
everybody's working together. And in Casey's case, with the city's resources, it's kind of that hub and spoke model. It's like you're the hub in the middle and we're all spokes out there that you can slide it out to us. It's like, we need this from them. And that's the beauty of it. It's like, I mean, we're all here and all invested in the same thing and your success at the end. Uh, So I I appreciate you sharing because I think a lot of people don't understand the part that the municipality can play and and the powerful approach that you guys can take. So um, I want to stop real quickly. I understand there was, there was a participant, uh, Ashley, I think that you may have had your hand raised. Did you have a question for us or. And I don't know if, if we're set to Jackie, if we're set to let them ask questions uh, at this point or. Let's see if I can unmute. There we go. Ashley, you should be. Let me see if I can. And Jackie, bear with me. If Ashley can go ahead, go ahead. Hello. Yes, go ahead. We can hear you. Hi. So I'm a small um, cleaning business um, owner and I started off um, as so prop maybe about a year and a half ago. I LLC August the 21st of last year. Um, and I was just having issues with basically um, how to expand my business. So I started working with property management companies in my local area, which I wasn't receiving pay. So then I started doing Airbnb work, is what I do now. Airbnb work, I was doing maid services and things like that. Um, I started in Austin area. Um, I started off on like home advisor, think Angie's list, things like that. So when I was trying to expand, I started trying to seek bigger companies for commercial contracts. So um, I insured my business and things like that. So I was working with property management companies um, and I wasn't really, the work and the money wasn't adding out. It was adding out to only like just being a worker, you know, I wasn't receiving due pay. So I started getting to the Airbnb world, which I love the Airbnb world because I was making the same pay that I would do property management companies, but just less work, more profitable. So my problem is expansion. And then when you're trying to start off as a company, um, you don't have a lot of revenue. You're just trying to build your platform, you know? So it was just kind of hard for me. So um, I feel like with cleaning, the funding, like I would love funding, but I more would like jobs. I would more like to be able to, you know, go in, get the customers because I'm a hard worker. You know, I go in there, most of my clients that I ever work with, I, you know, they love me. I, I do hard. It's my business. So I put my all into what I do. So the expansion process in that is hard for me. Um, I went to a, uh, I went to a orientation with the Jettas in Dallas. They had a event in Dallas, uh, maybe two weeks ago, and it was supposed to be a five week program. Um, but I didn't continue going to it because, Um, It was just a little out of my distance. I'm in the Austin area and I'm still, you know, so they, I was speaking to a lady, I I think her name was Jasmine, and she said they're bringing it to the Austin area here coming in the summertime. So I feel like it would be more better for me to do it here in Austin, Um, you know, just, you know, so I can make sure I can make every event and things like that. So I would love to seek um, to be around more people that are empowered like me and entrepreneurship, women like me, because I've had a hard, hard time. Um, I, was, I was focused on doing business credit, trade lines, net 30s, everything like that. But I just really feel like for me, it's not the funding, it's the jobs. Well, and I think it sounds like maybe a lot of question is, is how do I, and maybe it's connecting with resources, like-minded business owners. You'd be surprised in the same industry. A lot of times, not everybody's cutthroat and against you. A lot of times they're your biggest allies. They'll help you give you tips and share things that they maybe stumbled over. But, but I think maybe and the three experts here can maybe lend some advice. Maybe it's trying to figure out, like you said, the scope of how you want to grow and that, that focus of of what step you need to take next. So I'll, I'll, I'll let the, uh, I'll let the experts here, maybe give a little input that might help there. I'll jump out first. Uh, uh, Ashley, I'd like for you to go, like I was mentioning earlier, our uh, resource site is austintexas.gov. 
And uh, from that website, I'd like you to read about a program called Community Navigators. Mm -hmm. And uh, what they do is they are uh, helping people who through the pandemic um, were, you know, affected or um, in any way, you know, it, it's not as black and white as that, but it was intended for persons who are uh, needing to help their business. And one of the common questions that I get is very similar to what you described. Um, you're looking for ways to expand your business or um, uh, narrow or streamline your marketing to be more effective um, and, you know, and increase your, your overall business. Um, it's a free program and you'll just do an application. Again, the, the program is called Community Navigators and you can find it at austintexas.gov. And uh, from there, you will be able to put in narrative exactly the way you described. I'd like assistance. This is my business. And this is the, an issue that I, or a wall that I'm running into. And this is the kind of assistance I would like. And, uh, and we have worked with about nine partners in the Austin area um, that can help you. Um, um, about half of them should be able to work with just the marketing part that you're asking about. So there, I, I got a feeling you, you'd be a great match for that. Uh, it's free of service or free of charge. Um, they can help with coaching, marketing. There's several different things they can do to help a business like yours expand or move in the right direction or just um, streamline and become more efficient. So definitely reach out to us on that and uh, turn in an application for us, please, online. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna echo what Casey mentioned about the Community Navigator Program. Actually, one of the Navigator agencies is an organization called EGBI, um, Economic Growth Business Incubators, and they have a cohort program specifically for cleaning businesses. Um, they've worked with when I say a number of them, like more than fifty plus businesses that are in the commercial and residential cleaning industry. Um, and so they have a network of women who are already in, in, in business owners, not just women, but business owners that are sharing resources, sharing connections, um, and really bringing this to the forefront in terms of the work that they do and being able to grow. Okay, thank you. Awesome. I have one thing to add to Ashley. <laughs> so I was there at the, when you were in Dallas. Um, so thank you for coming. And we will absolutely would love for you to come out to our Austin session. We'll make sure that we do stay in contact with you um, so that you do have access to um, other women and businesses and can join our JETA cohort here when you are interested. So um, yeah. Thank you, Ms. Jasmine. Ms. Jasmine, it was a pleasure meeting you too. It was a pleasure meeting you. And thank you for the question, Ashley. I know that I want to go a little bit more into how do we know when we're ready for capital and, and that type of uh, sort of going in that direction. But real quickly, I want to make sure a couple of questions that we can get answered. I know um, Liz asked Rashida about a contact number to get in on an empowerment session for just I would assume maybe that that would be found on the website. Is that is that correct? Yes, that is true. That is found on our website. Um, but I can also provide it. I can drop it in the chat as well. Um, I think that'd be great. And also, Casey, if you could put a link maybe to, I know what you were mentioning for Ashley, the program that she could look into, that would be a great link, I think, for the folks as well. And, and Costa, I know we talked a little bit earlier about, the, on a broad level, some of the, the ongoing efforts, and Raquel, I think, addressed it quite well. But I want to make sure, if you've got a more specific question, feel free to put that in there, and we can address it on a, you know, kind of, dwindle down a little bit more if you've got something more specific. So, um, so Joy, before we jump into the next uh, topic, Joy asked, are grants even a thing anymore? Um, I think we've got some folks here that can speak to that type of thing. I will tell you that we have a program now that uh, is eight to 10 weeks of education on everything from business plans to center of influence contacts to, um, to financial projections. And and part of it is lending, and part of it is also a grant program. So I think they're absolutely a thing, but it's, it's got to be a very strategic approach. And I'd love to hear maybe you guys real quickly give us some input on um, what folks can do if they're interested in grants. Yeah, um, I'm just going to say, you know, I've, I've worked in this industry for 16 years. Um, I used to be a small business coach and early on at the very beginning of my career. And that was a question that I've always heard, always heard about grants. And it's where traditionally the way that grants are structured is that they're structured from a place of strategy, like Chris mentioned, where an organization, if they have funds that they could be able to structure as a grant, they may do that, but it may be direction based in terms of industry or terms of region. Um, and so there are guidelines and requirements around that. I know with the CARES Act funds and then the ARPA funds that came from the federal government, that there have been grant programs that have been designed to be able to be helpful, especially due to COVID and the impacts of COVID on small business. 
Um, but those were not something that were historically always available and may not be historically available in the future. Um, so it's where grants are strategic, they're very few and far between, and they are not the norm. It is not normal to have access to grant funding for small business. It is not normal to have access to grants in any capacity, unless it's an organization or a federal agency that has truly said, we have been charged with designing this. And so I am going to speak to one program that is already in the marketing phase where they're talking about the program and now then the application is going to launch on May 15th. It's where the city council in Pflugerville have voted to move forward with a new grant program called Pflugerville Care Small Business Grant. And that program will go live with the application process starting on May 15th. And it's where I'll put a link in the chat about that so you can learn more information. It is open to businesses, whether they have a sole proprietorship and they're just, you know, so, you know, a cell phone business, or if they actually have employees, it's where it's available to all small business owners that are located in the city of Pflugerville. That's excellent. So yeah, Pflugerville Cares, you, you said, correct? Excellent. And yeah, some information in the chat would be great there. And I do think it's important to mention, I think that as the pandemic came about and a lot of things that happened, we've maybe grown a little more accustomed to thinking that 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 the grant is is the lowest hanging fruit on every tree. And and let's be let's be honest that it is difficult. There are a lot of resources, but there's also going to be a lot of competition there and they're not on every corner. So organizations like us, we will do everything we can to assist and help. But but it may not always be that that first and most available possibility. Um, and so important to be mindful of that. Um, I wanted to transition back over to something that I think is important and we see in, in my business, and I know everybody else on the panel probably sees as well. How does someone know and what kind of resources do you offer to them, guys, when they're trying to decide if they're ready to, to, to seek outside capital in a more traditional sense of, of a loan or borrowing? Um, and feel free, whoever wants to jump in first, what, is the, what does that conversation look like with your clients and what kind of tips can you give these guys about, hey, am I ready or what can I evaluate to know if I'm ready? I was giving Raquel the option, but um, I'll try. I'll chime in. Uh, traditionally, if we are going to uh, seek traditional financing, meaning leveraging um, HUD money or HUD loan money, which is still a loan, um, with any other outside uh, sources, um, the timelines usually start at about two years of history. So, with our programs, they would like to see that you have been operating and generating income. Um, at about the two-year mark. Um, that's pretty much the baseline for uh, traditional lending uh, as far as the programs I'm involved with. And with that, it's gonna be traditional um, uh, underwriting as far as how your bill paying has gone, um, debt, a lot of the things Raquel mentioned um, that are evaluated, um, your you know, traditional history marks, uh, I'm sorry, traditional credit marks. Um, so you, most people should be able to kind of know their personal history and their business as far as that 24 month window. So that's where we will start looking if we're going to go that route. Like I said, for smaller micro loan programs, we can obviously operate with a little bit less, um, but you're talking about smaller uh, funding. With the city of Austin, our micro loans usually run 10,000 to 35,000. So significantly less than uh, seeking traditional financing for through the family business loan program. Um, but most, if, if someone is unsure, we, we have that conversation all the time. If they're willing to share some of their uh, tax history and uh, uh, financial records with us, we have a great consultant that can review that, you know, at a moment's notice, just kind of glance at it and, um, and decide or we're ready for the application or these are the things we would suggest. Um, so for, like I said, for the city side, that's what would be a traditional um, conversation or opening that uh, conversation about applying for traditional finance. Okay, and so it sounds like there may be some barriers there that everyone needs to be aware of with how long you've been operating. Uh, but I know we've got a lot of folks here that may have a great idea and haven't started operating. Um, and so that's going to be a concern. I know, Raquel, maybe you can speak a little more to anything different on your end or any other things besides that length of time in business that, that a particular business owner should be mindful of when they're trying to decide how to grow. Yeah, definitely. So I think what we do is, like I mentioned before, we look at the project. And so we look at the business owner and what they're trying to accomplish. Are they trying to grow for the sake of growing? Are they growing because they have demand and it's been pent up and they want to be able to hire employees or they've got so many orders that they don't have enough production equipment to move forward with? 
we look at it based off of what they're trying to do. We have a number of business owners that are very content in the size and the structure that they're at, but it's where they still have to do things like building improvements, or they have to get new signage because their signage was damaged. It's where they're looking to just stay up to date with technology. And so a lot of the times the strategy that we do is just coaching, visiting with them and talking to them about, about what their need is. I've had business owners in the past who said, I need $100,000 to do X, Y, and Z. But when we really look at the project and we look at what they're trying to do as a strategy, we scale it down. And then it turns out they maybe really only needed $25,000. And then we look at where are the sources are coming from for that? How are they going to use that money? And where are they going to get money from? Do they have cash flow? Do they have reserves? One of the things that people do for lending is that they come to us as lenders because while they may have cash flow and they can possibly self-fund, which a lot of our small businesses, especially our businesses of color, who have learned that they don't have always access, if it'll be, it's where they'll self-fund and we will try to teach them about how they can be able to do it with access to capital and leveraging funding and being able to then reserve those funds for another use be able to pay every day in terms of operations and then use the, uh, the dollars that they borrow to be able to expand, to be able to get that equipment, to be able to grow. And so really that first step in the whole process is just the discussion, the planning. That's where we're working. And I talk about accountability and I know Rashida's talked about accountability with the trust piece. It's where we stand by them to be able to help keep them accountable for the responsibility of where they wanna grow and move forward with. And so that's the first place, right? Just getting connected, understanding the project, figuring out the need, and then it's directing them to who's going to be the less, the rep, the best lender for what they're looking to do. We're not always a lender. It's where we are referring them to traditional lenders. We're referring them to the other nonprofit lenders, the CDFIs. We're connecting with Casey and saying, hey, the city of Austin's micro loan program or their family business loan program is a good fit based off this project. We're looking at, is it a big project related to commercial real estate? Will there need to be multiple factors in charge of that? Are we going to have to have a traditional lender and a nonprofit lender come together to be able to structure this deal? So that's the other piece of it. It's one strategy around what are we looking to do with the project? Then it's about how do we structure the, the funding, the, the sources of the funds for this project, and what are they going to be used for? And then it's going into, let's go through this underwriting process, right? Let's talk about the credit. Let's talk about the collateral. Let's talk about, you know, the cash flow. Let's talk about the projections. Because it's one thing to have an idea now. It's one thing to have a strategy to move forward, but it's about then actually performing, right? The accountability. And so it's about moving forward and understanding how are you projecting? And are these realistic? Is this in your industry? Is this how it really happens? Or do we need to be realistic about change and setbacks and the technology that's happening where people are moving into a different direction? And so it's where we have these big conversations and it's not like going and get a car loan. Your car, when you go for a car loan, that car's collateral. So it's easy to do a finance deal on that. And even with real estate, your home, when you get that mortgage, is your collateral. But when it comes to a business, the lenders and people are taking that risk and they're doing it based off trust. They're putting it based off your value. They're putting it based off of your ideas. And it's a lot of work and it's a lot of responsibility and we're really taking and going to bat for you when it comes to moving forward with the project. And so there's so many different facets in small business lending. It's hard to just cover it all in like this panel and talk about it. And so I think it's really about then creating the relationship, whether it's with a traditional banker, whether it's with one of our community partners, whether it's with one of our organizations, it's about creating that trust with them to say, hey, I wanna know what's out there. I wanna know what resources and can you help me navigate those? And so first and foremost, when it comes to the lending side of what we do, that's exactly what PCL is most important about is navigating those resources and connecting them to the right lending for their projects. And I, and I, I want to hear, I want to round this off by hearing Rashida and how she might uh, talk to her clients about this. But I do want to point out one thing that I think, think is a common thread here is, and I love it because we do it too, is it's, it's sit down and have a conversation and learn about uh, someone's business or their dream or their idea. And then from there, educate them some too. Um, I think that's the big thing. And, and like you said, Raquel, they're all different. Everything is different. And where someone's coming from is different. Their, their expertise level as well. But Rashida, what can you share about, uh, because I like how trust-based and, and conversational your organization is. How do those conversations go when you first navigate with a client, uh, you know, to try to help them determine what to do? 
Sure. Um, so two things I love there. I love the fact that you said this, Chris, and also Raquel, this was one of your main points that you start with just a, a conversation and a discussion with the client. Um, it's incredibly important to assess where they are. Um, one of the things that just is we're able to, we have so many different products and you can start with as low as a dollar our customer or our clients, because if you just want to come in and borrow literally five dollars to just figure out how this thing works um all based upon trust and you want to pay it back over some a certain amount of time then we want to help you do that um and with us it's really about peer support um that's really what we leverage and community so we really take the time to figure out even if it's just a thought that you have we have certain products um that can assist and help with like developing and fleshing out your um your idea your business idea so it may have have been where you're thinking about, I'll take Ashley, for example, you're thinking about that cleaning uh, business and you're thinking about the things that you want to do and what you may need, but you just don't know where to start. So we would then have a discussion with you, find out how we can help. If there are any partners that we know that we can work with that may be able to assist you and help you um, get your foot in the door and then see how our products then or our other products would help push you along. So you moved on from the $5. Now you want to take out the loan for 500. If that is something that you want to do, if you feel like you're at the place um, where you can kind of move up. So with honest, with us, honestly, it is about um, having a discussion, figuring out your dream, um, which is what I, I always come back to that. I think it's so much for us people to see it on paper um, and actually see what it is that you are trying to build, like what your business is, what you, how you want to grow it. And we really assess how to get you there um, and the different ways that we can help and hope to build trust in the process. And I love hearing that. And I know uh, years ago I worked in banking and I, I hated that part about it because it was a numbers game. It was, if the first thing we talked about was a dollar amount, then I thought everything was, was going to go the wrong direction from there. And if they didn't just have the specifics that you needed for that dollar amount, it was almost like there was an eject button on the chair and it was next and that's why I don't sit in those chairs anymore. And I think that for, for all of you folks that are here, hearing this, there's so much that you can learn by embracing this approach and using these resources. I mean, it's fabulous that, you know, now more than ever, we have amazing resources that are highlighted to, to help you not only get a business started, but be a really savvy and, and ultimately successful business owner. And uh, so I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the, the lending process and what that what a client needs to look like when they come to you, if, if they're looking for something like that on different levels. But real quickly, I know that it looks like Liz, maybe you had a question. Let me see if I can get you unmuted here. Um, Liz, go ahead. Yes. Can y'all hear me okay? Um, I had a visual art business selling uh, jewelry that I made and um, gelling uh, drawings. And I wasn't making a profit. I just jumped in and really didn't have any structure or help. And I had a lot of health issues, so I couldn't keep up with a lot of stuff. And eventually I ended up having to close because of health issues and um, actually losing the use of my hands because of an incident because of COVID, I couldn't get a personal shopper at the local store and I had to wheel myself in a shopping cart in a shopping cart around the store, which damaged my hands. So I couldn't work at all after that. So I ended up having to close my business. So now that I haven't had any income for mostly a year now, are more like two years. And I both have a lot of debt, both medical and not being able to pay bills. I was wondering what kind of funding I might be able to get to reopen a business and um, start that again. My main goal is to bring um, art back to the public school children. Um, I feel like uh, the children in public schools are not getting the chance to have as much art experience as they used to, and also provide um, artists a way of 
actually making a better income to where they can create art and not have to work a different job. And through that, I also want to do my own artwork. And so I have a whole mind map of all these businesses I want to start. I know I have to start small. And my two things that I'm concentrating on right now is to put my previous artwork on clothing and sell that and also try to open up an artist workers co-op on my property. And I was wondering what type of funding I could look at because I know I can't get a loan at this point. And so it sounds like we're trying to navigate some, some pretty intense challenges, but still having an idea and a passion. Uh, what kind of resources maybe uh, would be recommended guys? Um, yeah, I was going to say one of the resources, while they're not necessarily a lending institution, is the Texas Department of Assistive and Rehabilitation Services. Um, they specifically are designed and developed to be able to help people with physical or mental disabilities prepare and keep jobs and self-employment. They actually have a small business program, and I've worked with a number of individuals from their program who have been able to get funding. Um, they've had to do things like put together a business plan, put together financial projections, be able to prove and show to be able to get that investment from the department. Um, but that is one resource that I could put in the chat and put a link to their website to kind of share more information yeah, about. Is that the one with the Texas workforce? Um, they are a state agency. They are, I don't think, specific to Texas workforce. Okay. And Raquel, thank you for that. That's that's great information. So, and that'll be in the chat for everyone. Um, real quick, one question. I think Ashley, you may want let me let me unmute you here. Um, and then Ashley, go ahead with your question. Hi. Okay. So when we're talking about the market and demand, so in my line of business, the market and demand for cleaning is it's phenomenal you know with within every job there's always something that needs to be to have a cleaning done whether it's restaurants hotels like just anything that you think you need a cleaner to be done a clean to be done what i've noticed is that cleaning is is very lucrative it's very lucrative but it's just trying to find an outside source that doesn't um, okay, so a lot of people go to certain platforms, like I'm a, man, a member of Turnover b, &B. Um, There was a there was a some people who found me uh, through Turnify. They reached out to me through Google because I have a Google. Um, I'm on Google, so they reached out to me. So I have small jobs through them. So it's kind of like okay, I do a job through them, and then I do Turnify, which was uh, Turnover b, &B which requires bids. And it's like, I need to figure out how I can cut out the middleman for, and then just have people come straight to me um, for jobs. Because obviously when I work through certain plot platforms, um, they require a percentage of my money. And then especially with turnover BNB, I'm not sure um, if anybody's in the cleaning industry that for Airbnb specifically, um, they expect you to do bids. When you do bids, you're uh, bidding against other cleaners and there's low, low bids. So it leaves me um, in the stance where I'm figuring out how to navigate where I could do my bids, even, you know, for whatever type of job, whether it's construction job, you know, uh, restoration, things like that. How can I do my bids appropriately? But I just really rather cut out the middleman and figure out how to navigate the system without um, a third party to kind of direct me for what they think my bid should be or what they think that I should be able to get or things like that, you know? So that's my, my, my struggle. Um, I understand everything that's being said about the funny, but you know, one thing I know is if you get out there, you do work, you know, I've handed out cards. I've stood in front of Home Depot, handed out cards. I've posted flyers on, um, just everywhere. I've did everything, but I still cannot beat the system of those big platforms where people actually go to and say, hey, I'm looking for this. I'm looking for this particular job. I need this to be done. And then they go back and forth with me, the cleaner or other cleaners to say, okay, can you do this? Can you do that? 
Um, so um, I don't mean to just like kind of say the same thing over and over uh, repetitiously, but it's really something that I'm that I'm really struggling with. Um, yeah, so I've actually worked, work, 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 and then I said, okay, um, let me try to go into my business uh, just working um, as my own uh, business owner, and it was a complete fail. Um, I literally built my credit to a point where, you know, I was doing really okay. And then I started applying for business things to try to enhance my uh, business with uh, equipment loans and things like that. Mm. Revenue was okay. It was just like I was put off to the side. But I'm literally sitting here trying to figure out a way to beat the nine to five, trying to figure out a way to create general wealth for me and my family, you know, just trying, you know, as hard as I can, um, just to, you know, just get ahead. So my, my thing is like, it's just that I cannot beat it. I cannot beat the way to say half people. And I was very happy when uh, the, the company reached out to me. I was like, hey, we found you on Google. Woo -woo. It was just like, you know, it was a proud moment for me. And I do do jobs for them, you know, but I get paid a certain percentage. But just imagine if I cut the middleman out and I can get those people to come to me directly and I can make the money directly myself. Um, I don't know. I just really think you're in business, you need to be full uh, of the same, um, you know, that's just like you business minded people. Um, that can have different resources. Um, so that's something that I really want to do, but I don't know. It's just, it's just, it's, it's, it's very, it's very hard, you know, especially when you've been at this thing for um, a year and a half when I've been at it for a year and a half. So I've had to quit a job, go back to a job, even just like now I'm thinking like, hey, I might need to get a part-time job because my Airbnbs is not paying me, but it's not that I don't have, I don't have, um, jobs because you know I do do jobs so I, I do jobs for Airbnb but how can and I, I think too actually I think that's that's one of the things that's tough about uh, and maybe some of us have some resources that we can put in the chat for maybe some strategic groups because it, it can be tough when you're competing against those bigger players who have a scale and a scope that they can almost undercut you on bidding for jobs and then you bring in a third party who they're looking to make a cut off of it as well and so they're taking some from you and it really can limit and I think that's that's difficult. It's not only your industry. There's so many out there. And and I, and I do we, we want to try to maybe we can throw some resources towards you that while that's not specific to lending, there may be some strategic avenues out there that some of these experts have that they can offline say, hey, try this and maybe connect with this group or there's a center of influence over here that might be beneficial to you. So so we'll see if we can't put something out there for you in the chat um, or provide it at, at the end of the, the panel that might help out. Okay, thank you guys. I really appreciate that. No problem. I want to I want to take some time to focus because there's a lot of folks that are at different stages here with with their business and and there's different types of financing. Um, but from the three panelists that we've got here and, and what your entities can do for folks, you know, maybe you can give us some tips on what folks should because we do this every day, so we just take it as second nature, but. What should folks have? How should they be prepared? Is there kind of a short list of priorities that maybe you can say, hey, these five things are really a good place to start if you're not prepared here? And educate us a bit there. I'm sorry, Chris, you cut out a little bit. Can you, do you mind repeating that? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I wanted to I wanted to direct it back to you all to help some of these folks understand if they're if they're wanting to get prepared to come for external financing like a loan. Um, what types of things do they need to be prepared for? What are those big things and what are those really good starting points that they can start digging into and working on now to be that good candidate? I was going to say um, tax returns. <laughs> Complete your tax returns and actually report your business income and expenses correctly. I know sometimes businesses choose to, you know, maybe kind of just finagle the way that their revenue or expenses come in because they don't want to pay the taxes on it. But at the end of the day, those issues and changes do affect the way that lenders look at you. And so put information accurately on your financial statements. Um, and then track your income and expenses monthly. It's where, whether you're using a bookkeeping service, whether you're doing the bookkeeping yourself, um, if you're using technology like QuickBooks, or if you're doing an Excel spreadsheet, it's where do it monthly. Don't put it off. Don't pretend like it's not there. 
Um, and if you need help, there's a number of nonprofits and for-profit and companies that do help with financials and just putting together your cash flow, putting together your profit and loss, and putting together a balance sheet. Whether or not you have tons of assets or not, you want to put together a balance sheet for the business. Um, the balance sheet is what lists what you have as cash and assets. So what cash you have in the bank associated with your business. Um, your assets that you have, as well as your expenses, your liabilities, your debt that you have for the business. It's where being able to do those financial statements are so important. And those are things that you want to have ready at any point in the game. And once you get started with your business, regardless if you're applying for funding or not, but just so you can know financially where you're at. And if this is something that you're doing that's on a small scale, or if you have the capacity to really grow and develop it and to use your own personal funds as well. Um, I think the thing that we've always gone back and forth on is a business plan. It's where we've gone through a traditional business plan where you have the objective with the strategic goals, with your staffing, with your, your way that you are putting together your growth strategies. And then we have these lean canvas models where you're really putting in just basic information about your opportunities, your threats, your weaknesses, your strengths, and what are the pathways to get there. And so there's a lot of fluidity when it comes to a business plan and what's necessary. But what I think we're all looking for is to be able to see, and, and Rashida brought up this design of drawing an image of what your dream is, is putting it on paper. Unless we can see it on paper, then we don't really know what's in your head. We don't know what you're really thinking. We're not, we don't really see what you're seeing because we're not looking at it from your lens. We're not in your mind to be able to figure it out. So what we want to be able to do is see your dream on paper to understand it, read about it, and get what you're getting and kind of click and so I think that's really key and important. Um, you know, there's a number of things that a lender will say, well, we need these financial documents and these, but those are things that we can work with you on. Until we know what your project looks like, until we know what kind of size of a loan you're looking for, then we don't want to get you inundated and overwhelmed. And like I said, it's not like a car loan. It's not like where you're doing a quick application online, um, filling out basic information and us having run credit. We're doing a lot more. We're building a relationship. So it's being able to have you set time and make this a priority and understand that it's not gonna be a 24 hour turnaround. I think that's really the other thing is just be prepared mentally that you're coming in to build a relationship with a lender who's non-traditional, which means that we're going a little bit more beyond. And so the turnaround time is gonna be a little longer. And what we're gonna focus on is, can you really show us your dream? And can you have the financial information for us to understand what direction you're coming from and where you wanna go? And, and I'd like to hear maybe Rashida from that trust-based perspective, because BCL talking a little bit more about not traditional lending, but, but still more uh, maybe credit focused and financially focused lending. Uh, how does, what does it look like with you guys? What's important to come to the table with early? Sure. Um, I just want to add one thing is that I think all those things just as a, a business owner myself and working with other entrepreneurs that it is incredibly important to have things that Raquel um, stated as far as you need in those and having your um, just financials in order as far as your business goes incredibly important. But when it comes to just you um, don't necessarily need to have all of those. Um, like I said, you can start with an idea. So just um, you qualify just by having a, a business and um wanting to do more and wanting to grow your business. That's really the only thing you have to have when you start, when you come to just, when you're interested in, you have this dream of um, growing it and wanting to find, wanting to have access to capital, peer support and community, the need of those things, that's kind of how you qualify. You don't have to bring anything with you. You don't have to have a list of things that are in order. When it does come time to get in a loan for us, we do ask you for like a breakdown of what you plan on spending the loan on. And that's generally to um, help you more than anything. So you're able to assess and see what it is that you, where you want your, your funds to go, what you, um, so you have an, a more, even more clear vision of how you're spending um, and how you're looking to grow your, your loan and what you're hoping to get from it. So there's nothing that you need to have in hand, but your, your, your dream in your mind and your vision. So thank you. And so some varying processes, varying types of loans. I'd like to round this topic off before we go into the general Q&A and wrap up the session. Casey, a little bit more traditional, I know, in terms of the lending model on you guys is in. Maybe you can give us just a little bit to round off this particular topic about what you guys need to see early on from a, a client to be able to, to seriously move forward. 
Like I said earlier, and uh, the ladies obviously have touched on this um, in, you know, from a different aspect, um, for the, from the traditional side, and I hate to say that it's just traditional because we do have a little flexibility at the city, but if we're going to be working through traditional lenders um, to fund a project, um, it will, like I said, there'll be a two-year area. They're going to want to see some traditional historical information, tax information. As Raquel said, that's where your honesty is going to help you the most um, as far as record keeping. Um, so, uh, and, and then from the holistic approach, we'll look at um, just patterns, um, a lot of uh, bill paying patterns, things like that is what they're going to want to see. And, say, and that, uh, like you said, that's if we're going to be seeking larger funding, um, if we're looking for traditional, working with traditional lending institutions to fund a larger project. From the smaller side, like I said, under 35,000, we still have some leeway there. We like to see you know, some good patterns we like. Um, you should be able to prepare, be prepared to talk about your project extensively um, in good detail with some good support information, talk about what your business is, how it's grown, what's happened historically, issues you've come across or problems you're facing or successes you've had. But be able to um, paint us the picture, as the ladies have said, of what your vision is going to lead to what you're trying to achieve. And, uh, and we have, like I said, when it comes to our microloan programs and with some of our partners here online tonight, there is some flexibility out there. There is some flexibility out there where, you know, there is more to it than just your credit score and your dollar, your uh, um, income. So hopefully someone would be prepared, um, like I said, to talk extensively about what they're seeking, um, extensively about what their historical information has been. This is our tax situation. This is our income situation. Uh, this is what we need. You know, just be able to have that conversation, um, you know, a, a good conversation about what their needs are. And that's the best chance they have of us pairing them with um, what they, with the next partner that they're going to need, whether that's going to be coaching or whether that's going to be a traditional application for a loan. Excellent. Thank you. I, I think to round off that piece, I, being a CDFI and being a lender uh, my entire career, you know, things like it's not just about credit, but even when times are tough, if you have that Capital One card and the minimum payment is $30, you may not be able to pay the whole thing off, but don't turn a blind eye if you can help it and just let it go 30 and 60 and 90 days late. Just do what you can and tread water there because remember, you know, you are your business. And so your habits and the way you handle things is all we really have to go on initially about how this business will look. And so we do, we don't, we're not just looking at the score. We need to see that part of who you are and it helps so much. And it builds a lot of character and strength and momentum for your approach to any sort of funder. Um, so I can't emphasize that enough. And then also talking about your passion and selling your business. That dream needs to come out on paper. You've got to practice that part so that you can in turn let us know how great it is because we need to see it just like it is inside of your head. So uh, and I think we're all really passionate about that. Guys, I want to open it up with the remaining time that we have for some questions. And I see we've already got a few in the Q&A. So if you can use that, bear with me. We'll try to get our experts to, to address as many as we can in the time we've got. Um, one quick question, Rashida, I think that we can answer pretty quickly. So credit's not looked at initially for you guys, but do you report to the bureaus as they pay those loans off so they can build some credit? That is a fantastic question. And yes, I'm very happy to report that starting in May, we're able to report to the credit bureaus. Um, it actually just launched this month. So we are able to. Excellent. Okay. And um, we've got a question from Brianna that uh, she would like to hear on average how long it takes to go from submitting um, the funding application to getting funds dispersed. And I know that there, there's, there's a variety here and I know for a lot of reasons. So maybe I'll let somebody uh, here address that just on a general sort of level. Um, I was going to say, speak. Oh, oh, go ahead, Casey. No, no, go, no, ahead. no, no, no. go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, um, once we have everything, and when I say everything, every document, not just the application, but any supporting documents that are part of the package, the loan package, it's where typically we'll do a preliminary review of financial information to make a quick determination. And that way we can follow up with you without having to go through a whole denial or long underwriting process. It's where if we're able to make the determination that we can see success in terms of being able to move your application forward for approval and funding. And that's where it turns about a one week to two week turnaround time, depending on the size and um, type of project it is. 
if it's going to be a big project like commercial real estate, or if it's going to be um, an SBA related project where we have to get approval from SBA, then it may possibly go up to 30 days, depending on the turnaround time from working with SBA. But when it comes to an in-house loan that we're able to do, I would say a two week turnaround time. I know with Casey, his is different. His is government. So he has to go to city council possibly, right? Yeah, yeah, Raquel makes us look like a tortoise. I was going to say we're really slow compared to that. Um, our traditional larger projects are required to uh, go before city council. So if some of the ones you mentioned, if these are going to be real estate related or anything like that, those are average uh, probably about six months to a year. Um, I'm wearing one of those right now, actually. And then for our micro loans, the good thing about our micro loans is that they don't require city approval um, for the dollar amounts we're talking about. Um, so those range as quick as six weeks to maybe three months is about average for our micro loans. That's a good, a good um, moving along as long. And, but the key there is what Raquel said, once we have all the required information, that's when that timeline starts, not from the first conversation, but when we re we've received the completed application and all the documents that are required um, from that point, that's where we're talking 30 to 90 days for a micro. I wanted to jump in there as well, Chris. So uh, with just, you actually can start as, soon as tomorrow. So let's say you all are interested and you're interested in learning more about it. We have certain products where you can get access. Um, you can begin your loan process tomorrow and get access as soon as next week. Um, and a part of that, which I should have mentioned earlier, uh, when asked about what you should bring with you, what you should bring with you is someone who you trust because our community is incredibly built up on that and everything we do works in tandem with another person. So you, in order for the product that I was speaking about where you have access to it and you can start tomorrow, you would need someone else to be um, bonded with you in that, in that process and in that program. So um, as soon as tomorrow and it, you can pay back loans um, usually up to 26 weeks and beyond. So you can take your time and pay them back. So uh, that, that's great information. And, and Brianna, building off of what you uh, just asked, uh, when you ask about what to do if you're denied funding, I think you can see from these different entities here, there's a common thread of it's not just a no and push the button that, that sends the chair out. It's a no with some explanations and a no with that sit down of, hey, you know what, you should try this. This is the credit piece that we need to work on. Or you need a little bit more robust detail in your business plan or those projections. Have you compared them against industry standards? Have you vetted that completely? That's what you're going to get from, from our organizations uh, is you're going to get help. You're not just going to get a, a no, you're going to get a no that helps you come back to us uh, when, when you've spun that no into a yes. Um, and But the next question you asked, I think these guys can address for their specific entities, small business loan repayment terms. What are the terms? What do interest rates look like so that somebody can understand what they might be paying back every month? say with our organization um it's where our interest rates range and they can range from as small as five percent to as large as ten percent we don't go beyond ten percent at this time um, and when we do smaller loans on terms of a uh, working capital loan which is going to be used for just overhead expenses payroll to pay for operations it's where traditionally the term is going to be about three years 36 months it's where when it's working for equipment and major um, commercial real estate or, or improvements, it's going to be based off of the term of the collateral, which is maybe five years to even 10 years, depending. Um, and so our average is going to stay around three years. Um, our interest rate average is right around 8%. Um, and it's where it's on par with banks, right? And so it's where we're not charging exorbitant fees. And ultimately, too, we're not a bank. We're not getting depository relationships. We're getting investments from traditionally banks who cannot do small business loans like the way we can. And so what they're doing is they're investing with us and they're asking us to pay an interest rate on that capital. So the change is really small in terms of what we do, do we do charge. Um, and so we really say to try to be affordable and we actually show you the difference in what that interest really accumulates to over that period of time so you can understand. Um, I wanna go back to the piece of, you know, when you're denied, there's two different ways to look at a denial. There's a denial based off of items that you can control. You can go back and work on your credit. You can go back and look at what you can be able to do in terms of strategies for your business to be able to be successful if that was one of the reasons. What you can't control is you can't control the guidelines. You can't control what banks set up as requirements that are minimum. And so it's where I can give you an example of I did a small business loan and because of my guidelines, I could not do a second loan to him while he still had an active loan at the dollar amount he was at. But what I could do, because I knew he was a strong business that I could refer to another resource, is I connected into people fund. 
And People Fund did approve him for that loan that he needed to be able to pay off additional debt that he had outstanding. And it's where we were able to work together. And so it's where it was out of my control. It wasn't a denial because at the end of the day, I didn't really underwrite him. But what I did do, like Chris mentioned, is do a referral to another resource that I knew and I checked in with and we connected to be able to make sure that he can move forward with that funding. If Chris would have said, or people fund, not Chris, because Chris wasn't the loan officer on that one. But if they would have come back to me and said, we can't do the deal either, Raquel, because we have a guideline rule, then I would have been able to communicate that back to the borrower and explain specifically that it's around guidelines and not your personal controllable situations. And then we would have addressed how we could work with another resource. It's a beautiful thing. I'm working with a client now that has DreamSpring and Lift Fund and needs more capital and we're able to help. Um, and it's, it's all about working together. Uh, Rashida and Casey, maybe any uh, different structure, especially for Just because it's so unique, what the, the length of loans look like for you guys? Sure, wonderful question. So we have different things because we have different products, but um, with our personal loan, with that, it so our loans are paid back weekly, which is nice. And um, for a personal loan, it's usually 10 weeks. So out the smallest amount you can take for that is $500. So you would pay back um, $500 over 10 weeks is about $50. And there is a fee that's associated with, there's no interest rate, but it's a $20 fee. As I said, there's two people involved in that. So the first person would pay $20 um, or the person number one would pay $10, $20 because they have access to the loan immediately. And the other person essentially is setting up a savings plan um, and they pay a fee of $5 with that. So that's, um, that's the term on that program product and then there's another one where uh, terms vary anywhere from 13 to 26 weeks and depending on how large of a loan it can go up a little bit more from there so if you do have access to the ten thousand dollar loan then you have just a little bit more and your apr uh, varies on that as well and it's all factored into the um into the loan so you don't have to worry about having to figure out how much it is you have to pay at the very end. Like it's all broken down and we tell you weekly payments, this is what it will be. And it all works up on a uh, depreciating loan. So as long as you make your weekly payments, the amount of your loan stays the same um, every, every week. And um, you don't have to worry about this large um, amount that you will be paying at the end of it. It's every week and you, you know what it is and how much it's gonna be. I love that. It's unique, but it's also very straightforward. And it sounds like guys maybe go to the Just website and I'm guessing there's more detail about some of those breakdowns and how it works in case they didn't pick up everything that you just mentioned. Absolutely. And I dropped our customer service and our number in the chat. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to our customer service. And I can also put my email, reach out with questions and I can, I will be the person, not a robot. I will be the person to contact you back and let you know. That's awesome. And Casey, uh, on some of the products, you mentioned some of those bigger, uh, up to a million versus a small micro. Can you give us a quick idea of, of what payment structure would look like on the big and the small there, maybe? Sure. On the larger loans, which are the family business loan program, uh, those are usually set up on a 10-year plan, uh, obviously monthly payments. And those interest rates range from about 1% to 5%. The majority of those being closer to the 1% uh, on our um what's it called, microloan programs, which is like 10 to 20, 35,000. Those are usually set up on a 60 month payment plan. And uh, and they're a little higher, they range from about two to maybe in the twos to 5% uh, interest also. Perfect, and thank you. And guys, bear with me, I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure we get our questions answered. If you got something, please try to put it in there. Again, if we don't get to everything, we'll certainly have these experts resources and their information put in so that you guys can reach out and have some one-on-ones and some quality time asking those additional questions. I like what Virginia put in and I'd like to address that guys real quickly because we get this a lot in our business. So, you know, alternative lending and different types of funding. Um, how do you guys as experts and somebody in the business recommend getting connected maybe with an investor if maybe traditional lending is not the way? Anything you guys can throw back at the crowd to let them know what they might do? You know, when it comes to investing, a lot of the time it's where we'll go back to our resources. There are investment groups that we worked with in the past. Um, it's where it kind of talks a little bit more of where we want to learn more about the project and be able to assess who's the best referral in terms of the resource. Because um, it's not like Shark Tank. We can't just pitch you in front of a group of investors. Um, we really want to be able to look at certain groups that are specific to industries. I know a group that's an investor group that wants to work for only hospitality industry businesses, but they want to work with like tech hospitality. 
Um, I have other investor group that is working with traditional kind of businesses that are breaking and doing, you know, what they call disruption in an industry. And so it's really where we want to be able to figure out the sweet spot. And so that's one of the things that, you know, connecting up investors isn't always as easy as, like I said, Shark Tank, but it's something where we all have a plethora of networks of individuals and people that we could connect with. And I'll try Casey, go ahead. Too. Casey, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just say that, um, unfortunately, I don't have as much um, uh, bandwidth in that area when it comes to investors. Um, what I have been told is that I work with, uh, I reach out to places basically like yourself, uh, like Raquel, um, as far as our partners in the community when it comes to uh, speaking, if someone is seeking uh, help connecting with investors. I, I, the city doesn't have as large of a uh, pool of uh, you know, resources for that. So we would, we would just re reach out to our partners in the community, like BCL um, you know, and such. And I would tag along at the end there that I always tell my customers and always have, practice your pitch, be detailed, have it on paper, and then go find people. You just do what you do. Be as passionate in front of them as you are when you first thought of it and find people. It, it, it's, it's very organic and it's not always easy, but, um, but it's very, very rewarding. So be prepared to sell anybody and everybody you meet on your idea and your business and your passion. So uh, guys, I know we've got just about a minute. Uh, I wanted to try to address, um, I think a lot of us may be sending the links for our contact info to just a private or direct message. If you guys can, Raquel, Rashida, and Casey, make sure we if we can send it to the entire group chat. And then if not, I know, Jackie, maybe we can go afterwards and send out a conclusive email that, that'll have everybody's contact info for you guys as participants. So um, I want to try to tackle one last question, if we can, if we've got the time. Um, Jim asked, uh, the last two years of re saw our revenue shrink dramatically, as of a lot of businesses, but my best path forward is to hire a dedicated salesperson. I have a current SBA loan that I'm thinking of trying to expand, but is there something I can show that will deflect the looks of the rapidly shrinking revenue? I've already taken some steps that will hopefully increase revenue in short order, but until that's realized, I'd still like to move forward with my expansion project, getting the financing to hire the salesperson to be able to kind of grow and build. Um, so a good question that I think we get a lot. Does anybody want to jump in and tackle that one here? And just to kind of to truncate it, so I think we, you know, you've got somebody that sees an opportunity to expand, and there's an avenue out there. But then you've got to deal with the COVID revenues and some of the the drama that we've had. How do you get somebody to listen to your story and not just look at that and maybe give you that opportunity because you know you can blow things up and keep it moving? I'm like looking at Casey because I feel like I'm starting all the responses to the questions. I'm like, let me have, let Casey or Rashida respond first. Um, but it's where um. A lot of the time, going back to what we talked about, sitting down and discussing it, being transparent, I think that's the thing. It's not about deflecting that revenue shrinking. We know, especially after the last two years, that revenue is shrunk for a lot of businesses. It comes down to industry. I talked to a business that you know had to let go of their employees because their revenue shrunk so much that they're not doing 100% of that job, plus another job just to make ends meet, to cover the overhead for the business and their personal home and expenses. And when we have the discussion, it's where she needs the capital to be able to pay rents, pay operations, and be able to hire back somebody so she's not stretched so thin. And it's about then having the conversation of what are the strategies you're doing. We know that when you're going out in marketing that it doesn't just happen overnight, that it takes time. And so it's about building out that, that window. How are we looking to do this? What is your timeline? And it goes back to the accountability piece. So I think, again, just having that transparent and honest conversation, sharing all the details information, being able to put in writing some of those goals and dreams that you're looking to do, and being able to be very knowledgeable about the changes, about the industry, and understanding if it's something that's in your control or something that's out of your control, because it might be an industry that's actually shrinking. There might be things that are changing that are beyond just COVID now, but it might be related to technology changes or the way that we as individual consumers of services and behaviors, how we're changing. And so it's where we're being able to have that honest conversation, we're able to brainstorm together. Excellent guys, I know we're on time, we're, we're up on, on the time here. I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So um, what we'd like to do, I know we wanna get, make sure that the contact information for all the panelists and experts today is out there for you guys. And Jackie, I'll turn it back over to you for uh, any concluding comments. This is fantastic. I mean, 
what a dynamic panel. You guys are fantastic. I appreciate you so much giving up your time today to um, talk to these folks about, you know, what it takes to be ready, you know, where you got to go, how it's going to be, and, and just sending them the resources. 